This is a poem by Edwin Muir um, that I think says this powerfully. Edwin Muir, a Scottish poet uh, from, from the last century. It's called The Animals. They, that is the animals, that is the non-human creatures, do not live in the world, are not in time and space, from birth to death hurled, no word do they have, not one to plant a foot upon, were never in any place. For with names the world was called out of the empty air, with names was built and walled, line and circle and square, dust and emerald, snatched from deceiving death by the articulate breath. But these have never trod twice the familiar track, never, never turned back into the memory day all is new and near in the unchanging here of the fifth great day of God that shall remain the same, never shall pass away. On the sixth day, we came. <clears throat> the reason I love that poem is a way, is the ambiguity with which you must read, the ambivalence with which you must read that last line. There is something different about this. We don't live in the world in the same way that other creatures do. We stand back from it. We make, we make a world out of the earth, in a sense, to use Heideggerian terms. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, some would say, and I think the deep ecology tends to this in this direction, that on the whole, it's a bad thing. It would be better if we would just kind of fit in. But we can't fit in, really. We're different. Uh, this was brought home to me um, vividly when I had the privilege of, re of attending the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. Um, and this, this great and important, but very frustrating meeting, um, um, was, you know, accomplished a lot uh, and didn't accomplish a lot more. Um, but it occurred to me about the second day, this was the Earth Summit, but only humans came. We were the only, <laughs> we were the only critters there. Um, and <laughs> I mean, that's sort of obvious, but it's significant, I think. Uh, we, we'd created lots of problems, uh, and the problems that we were there because of the problems we created, but we were also the only ones who were, who were concerned about it, aware of it even. So uh, there's something different about us. Um, we are more than just a part of the whole, more than just a part of creation. We have unique powers. Um, but we also, because of those unique powers, what's part of what's wrong with creation? Um, one of the distressing patterns I find in talks on environmental issues is um, bracing accurate, if somewhat depressing, analyses of the problems. And then, of course, we have to move from the problems to the solution, which I believe going tomorrow, and I'm going back to the future. And when we move to the problems, to the solutions, the, the answer tends to go something like this. We have been bad before, but that was because we were ignorant. Now that we know more, we must learn to be good. We must be good. And we have the resources now to do that. But that doesn't go far enough, it seems to me. Um, it's, it's, it's important to have that knowledge. It's important to, to have that determination to be good. But we don't seem to be able to be good. Um, and here I'm talking like an evangelical, as you will understand. Um, <laughs> Uh, because what's being denied here is the problem and the reality of human sin. That's another thing that seems to be unique about us as human beings. Um, and I think what's real, I think we have to address it. Uh, and I'll come back around to that in my concluding points. But let me me mention a little bit um, in uh, uh, the third issue that makes it hard to address these issues, these third problem that makes it hard to address these issues, and that's the problem of indifference. I've been working about 40 years in environmental education. And I've noticed uh, when, when uh, the group of scholars got together to do the research that produced this book, Earthkeeping, uh, Stewardship of Natural Resources, that I referred to last night, um, and that was published in the, it, put, it was done in the late 70s. Um, I, uh, um, I already felt that we were kind of past the crest of a way, this was a little late. As, Christians sometimes do. We came a little late on the issues, and it was time for the after the others had take, gotten uh, gotten involved, we got on the bandwagon, um, and that was true in a way because there was the, there th these issues seemed to come in waves of ten or fifteen years cycle, or the, the public awareness of them. 
Now, the issues, as we know, get worse and worse and worse. Climate change has been progressing steadily, uh, and uh, species depletion and so forth. But if you look at the, at, their, at the media awareness and media treatment of them, they tend to go in waves and cycles. Um, may, it, it, again, it seems to be 10 to 15 years. Um, and uh, I, I find that infuriating because I said the problems don't go away, but we only seem to be able to deal with them uh, in cycles. And I'm, I'm simply, I leave you with the quote from T.S. Eliot, uh, mankind cannot bear very much reality. <laughs> and, uh, and we just get tired of hearing these things. The newspapers and the media get tired of writing about them. And so they explore some other issue for a while. Now this one, I think, this time maybe is something different because of the immediacy and the scale of the problem. It's finally crept up on us, so we can't ignore it. And yet uh, there is this inability to focus on the real problems for very long. And uh, that's another issue, it seems to me. Uh, now, I want to uh, speak now to and about the constituency which I know best, which is the evangelical church. Um, and in saying that, I realize that we're, we're meeting in, uh, in the United Church headquarters. And, uh, and often, when we talk about Christianity in Canada, there's this big polarization between the evangelicals and the mainline denominations. And what's usually mentioned are Presbyterian, Anglican, and uh, United. Um, I'm kind of between that line, although I teach at a school that is uh, kind of a maverick evangelical institution, I suppose, Regent College at UBC. Um, but there is, it is, I think, important to, to recognize that divide. Um, it's a tragic divide. David Toyson spoke of it last night uh, in his, uh, late in his talk. Um, there is a kind of a caricature, which is not entirely inaccurate, that the evangelicals are concerned with getting right with God, a sort of vertical relationship, and uh, the mainline churches are concerned with taking care of the world uh, in social and environmental issues, and uh, they don't have much to do with each other. And there is some truth, truth to that, and it seems to me that's a tragedy, because it, it narrow, both, both concerned narrow the Christian gospel. Um, I, oh, I won't tell that story. <laughs> yes, I will. Uh, just, I, I, I really, uh, I, I kind of sentimental journey last night because I, I walked home from the Knox Presbyterian Church where we met down through the University of Toronto, uh, past where my wife and I spent our honeymoon, which was uh, in a dormitory at Victoria College. <laughs> uh, we got, I graduated from college on Monday morning, we got married on Monday evening, and I my wife graded papers in a motel at O'Hare Airport till 2 a.m. and then we, we flew to Toronto where I started my first job, which was uh, teaching linguistics for the Canadian Bible Society to missionary candidates. And that meeting happened at, at Victoria College. And it was, I, I, they were people I shared my faith with in a lot of ways, they were, they were fellow evangelicals. And they were so narrow in their understanding of what the gospel was, I didn't feel like I connected with them in anything except what I said I believed. And then, uh, after that, we went the same group to, to, to Madison, New Jersey, where we taught for uh, um, a much more liberal group of missionary candidates who were prepared to go out and fix the world. And I shared all, I felt I shared, I didn't share my faith very much with them, they didn't talk very much about it, but I shared the, the, the agenda, the goals. I, it, was, it was very frustrating. That's where I began to be aware of it. And I couldn't help but think about that as I, as I walked past uh, that fairly unromantic honeymoon cottage last night. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, I guess what I want to say in, in, in addressing that issue is I, I, I call on my mainline Christian brothers and sisters, uh, and really of, of whatever faith tradition you are, um, to accept the reality of sin uh, that um, that we don't seem to have the ability ourselves to fix ourselves. And as a Christian, I, I call on you to accept the reality of a new life in Christ, which is what the resurrection is about. Uh, it's not just a celebration of recurring life. It's about an event that changed history 
and that can change us. 